Everyone, it is TechSags Rewind, David Nuno, Billy Lucci. Billy, before we get into what we had on the show, I just want to point something out. Just broke my neck. Why is this in studio? Um, well, have you seen some of the people that come in here and breathe on these yeah, things? Yeah, you're they probably do, right. They do it in the morning. It's like, uh, yeah. yeah, right here. There you go. Sanitize, or it's, not, it's just the smell thing, right? It's a smell. Yeah, this one I don't think is a sanitizer, but yeah, we need some. Get some damn sanitation in here ASAP. Hey, sanitation. Sorry, that's my Tony Montana. Hey, guys. So today on the show, good one. Uh, we talked about what stood out at fall camp. I had a lot of points. You had some points, but I think we all agree it's a big team. Yeah, they look like I remember, David, when they came in and I remember conversations with Kevin Sumlin about how you're playing these teams that everybody expects you to beat. The Mississippi States of the world, uh, the old misses, uh, even even early on, like in Arkansas or South Carolina, these teams, and, and they're just so much bigger, even, even those teams in the trenches, much less when you were playing the Floridas and LSUs of the world. Well, now you look at A&M, and I would contend that in, in the pecking order, when they walk out on the field and you see them, it's Alabama, Georgia, A&M in that order, and, and the gap has closed so much, particularly with Georgia, but even with Alabama, the gap has closed so much over the, the time since Jimbo Fisher's been here. And that's what elite recruiting does. That's exactly And that's right. what having Jerry Schmidt, like Jerry freaking Schmidt, run your weight room does. Don't forget that. Now you've got a whole team of guys that the only strength and conditioning coach they've ever seen is Jerry Schmidt. So you got a bunch of seniors. It's like this is what four years under Schmitty looks like. You see Michael Clemens walk in there yesterday in that meeting room. Yep. And everybody's going, holy cow, that's what four years plus high-level recruiting. We also had Matt Hayes on talking about Bobby Bowden. We talked, Billy and I talked about it that as well. The 2020 Olympics coming to a close. And 21 in 21, McKinley Jackson brought to you by Factory Builder Stores. All that and more here on Tech Sags Rewind. SEC size is no joke. Now, I want to pause that for a second because I've been removed from the program for a couple of years, not seeing them as often as I do, uh, as I would like. But I've covered the University of Houston recently, and they have some big guys, one or two or three, right? And I, I, I remember the Johnny SEC days. There were some big guys. The difference, I think, and tell me if I'm wrong here, is the amount of size, the amount of depth and size, and you just look at these physically imposing players that is a championship caliber SEC style looking team. But you know what? It's still so much bigger than even that 2012 team. Yep. Um, you know, you had guys like Spencer Neely, who's a good player, but undersized. You had a lot of quote undersized guys. I mean, now you don't see the undersized guys. I mean, Jaden Peavy, and I mean this, I mean this in all respect, has a head like a mailbox. The guy is he's just, big. I mean, and he's a guy you almost forget about. And then everybody knows about how big Leal is. I mean, it, it's just, they've got, and I mean this, you look at a guy like Antonio Johnson, and he almost looks like defensive ends from 10 years ago. And I'm talking right. about like a Julian Obioha. Yeah, he was bigger than, than Antonio, but Antonio's a safety. He's in the, they almost look similar. Um, so, it's it's just yeah it's the an, amount of guys, um, uh, but the, the they're big on a like again like like that Florida team I, I saw just saw and that was by level. the way that was a national championship team by the right, way right 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 so they're big like that and and there's a lot of them so I think it's you know you're supposed to be big in college football especially sure. in the SEC but they, they just look the part. And the guys that aren't big are fast. Are fast. Anaya Smith looks like, obviously, thicker than we are, stronger, more muscular. Well, uh, maybe he is. Than, than you. I mean, I mean, maybe than me. Maybe not so much you, but go on. But go on. But you see what I'm saying? Like, he's a, he's a big, strong dude in the normal sense, not in the Michael Clemens gargantuan human being right. sense, right? But he is so fast and so quick. And I, I did a video yesterday, and that was the part that really caught me. And I've got a lot of notes that I took this weekend. The thing that caught me that I was so impressed by was like, yeah, oh, yeah, they're going to find different ways to use me this year. They did that last year. Mm -hmm. What else can they do? He says they've got more. Well, yeah. I mean, they, they've got so many weapons. We all know that. Uh, you know, there's another guy. 
that's big and fast, Jalen Watermeyer. Goodness gracious. Watermeyer's gotten me. I mean, they got guys that look like NFL players. First round NFL players. Yeah. I mean, it's, again, they're passing the eye test like crazy. Now, what does that do for you once you get on the field? Nothing. You've got to go out and play. Sure. But I would rather start, you know, August looking at guys that look like they're NFL players than not. Absolutely, especially with a coach like Jimbo. And I guess uh, first off, we, we were just reacting to the uh, the passing of, of Bobby Bowden. I know that you uh, had a lot of information on your social media channels yesterday. Just uh, a little bit about the the impact that he had on the game of, of college football. Just a wonderful man. And I'm not even talking about a football coach. Just a wonderful man. Um, I was very fortunate uh, to know him. Very fortunate to be you know good friends with his son, Terry. Um, you know, talked at length about him, sat down with him after he uh, was pushed out at Florida State about six months later before he talked to anybody about it. And he was just very honest and open about it and understanding of the realities of the coaching life where they're all hired to be fired. Um, you know, said he didn't blame he didn't blame Jimbo Fisher. Um, and just, you know, it's just he was upset because he was promised another year and didn't get it. That's kind of what he was saying, but he, you know the way he explained it to me about how he was so fortunate. You know, he he twice had a chance uh, to coach in the SEC. Once after Bill Curry left Alabama, and he decided to stay at Florida State, and another time about ten years earlier at LSU um, when they were looking for a head coach, and he went there the the weekend before they were talking to him about taking the job, and they went in and beat LSU in Death Valley. He told his wife, man, if we can win in Death Valley, maybe I should stay here. Um, you know, LSU ended up hiring Bo Ryan, who never coached it down there, died in a tragic plane accident. And, you know, Bobby looked at me and said, look, that could have been me. And, you know, 20 something years earlier, he was in West Virginia as an assistant head coach. And one of his good friends was at Marshall as an assistant uh, AD there and was trying to get him to go coach Marshall. And he was going to do it. And he finally said, no, I'm going to stay here because something told him to stay. And, Two years later, the crash, the plane crash at Marshall happens, and the head coach dies. And he looked to me and said, "That could have been me too." And you know, he—I think he had—he had a very good idea of what life was about, and what it, and what it meant, and what was important. And although football was important to him, uh, it wasn't his life. His life was his God and his family. And it was—he was just a great, great gentleman. Sounds good. Okay, so right. the Olympics wrapped up this weekend, right? Team USA uh, topped the medal count in both golds and overall medals. Uh, contributing to that, Chris Middleton in USA Basketball defeating France 87-82 to Friday night. K-Mid, four points, one rebound, one assist in over 10 minutes of action. Uh, pretty impressive double for Chris Middleton. He's had himself quite the month, yeah, yeah. Uh, an NBA title and an Olympic gold medal. Uh, pretty jealous of you, Chris. Uh, and then Saturday, early Saturday morning, Two Aggies running on Team USA's 4x4 relay teams. Uh, Aething Mo running on the women's side, helping Sydney McLaughlin, Alex and Velas, and Delilah uh, Muhammad post the fifth fastest time in world history, 3.16.85, nearly four seconds faster than Poland, who took the silver medal. Aething Mo, and a 48-32 split. That's a top 10 split in world history. By winning that gold medal, Aething Mo became just the first Olympian in 33 years to win two gold medals before their 20th birthday. Wow. That's that's impressive company. She's in. The, the last to do it was American Steve Lewis at the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, South Korea. That's pretty impressive. And then I wouldn't have said last year that McKinley Jackson was a it was a game-changing presence in there, but when he was in there, he was disruptive as a true freshman. Look, he's a guy I said from day one, he was a five-star caliber signee. He just missed that cut line. It's like Bryce Anderson. Those guys that just missed, Malik Silla is in that category right now. They're just missing that five-star cut line. McKinley should have been, as an interior D lineman with that kind of explosion and burst and power, you see like a Dalen Mack. McKinley's a, he, I think he's a more effective, like every down guy and, and, I think he can be he, – he's an all-SEC caliber interior D lineman. That's what he's got. That, that's his high end is all-SEC, high-round draft pick. He, he's, a, he's a disruptor, and he's a wrecking ball in there, and, and he's going to make teams block him with two because he is too quick, he's too explosive, he's too powerful. You try to block him one-on-one, -on -one, he's going to be in your backfield. 
screwing up what you want to do in the running game, and you see him right there. Uh, you see him there hitting Trask. He's also shown that he can get after the quarterback as well. So he And he's a big part of this, Nuno, because you lost Bobby um, early to the draft. He, he needs to be able to step in, and I, I do think you can have an upgrade at that spot as the year goes on. Now, the ideal upgrade would have been Bobby coming back. He could have been all world this year as a senior. But I think McKinley Jackson in 2021 can be better than Bobby was in 2020. So uh, one other thing that we do on Texas Rewind is we give us fitness tips. Billy, any fitness tips to the people? If you're like me, don't overdo it. Do not try to, uh, if you're doing like dumbbell stuff, don't try to do anything explosive after the age of 40. I know a lot of people would contend that you can do that. Yeah, I think a lot, more, a lot more people are like me. Like, you're just going to hurt yourself. No reason Let me give that. you my fitness tip. Eat well, stay active. Don't try to be a superhero in the weight room, especially when nobody's watching. Really, actually, <laughs> when someone's watching would be even less because no matter how cool you think you're going to be, you're not. you go hurt yourself in the gym around people, it's going to be embarrassing. I got a fitness tip. What's your tip, Dalton? Smash the like button. And what else are we supposed to do? Subscribe. Okay, that's the end of the show. Dalton's done the... working. Smash it. Dalton's work day is over. It's 11.01. Bye. You know, Adios. Gabe.